welcome everyone to a discussion today on Russia's cultural imperialism and cultural appropriation focusing on Ukraine. My name is Ksenia Kipizinski and I'm co-director of the Petro Yatsik program for the study of Ukraine at the Center for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies here at the University of Toronto. Uh, we are going to be hearing um, from several what I would call cultural warriors, um, ranging from an historian of Soviet Ukraine, uh, an art historian, a literary critic and scholar, and a musicologist. All of them are kind of involved in work on correction, correcting kind of attributions in art museums and databases, concert programs, and to the more kind of core activities of teaching literature, history, and music from new perspectives and resisting imperial narratives. And this work is not new to them. Um, we are going to hear from all four um, and it will be about 12 to 15 minutes for each uh, speaker. And I invite our uh, participants to put questions in the Q&A and I will monitor those after all four have finished. Um, I will briefly introduce everyone right now um, so that I don't, you don't hear from me and we hear from our speakers and we'll be going in this order. Uh, we will hear first from Mayhill Fowler. We're welcoming her back. Uh, she was a postdoctoral fellow here at Toronto a number of years ago um, and is uh, considered one of our kind of nice representatives uh, uh, representing U of T in some fashion. She currently teaches at the Department of History at Stetson University. She has published widely on culture in Ukraine. Uh, including her book, Beaumont on Empire's Edge, State and Stage in Soviet Ukraine, which was uh, published by University of Toronto Press in 2017. Her current projects focus on women in theater in Ukraine, as well as um, a project on Soviet military theater. Um, as I said, she's um, been a, a fellow at UFT as well as at Harvard and a Fulbright scholar. Um, and she's also a former actress. Uh, we have several performers here. Um, Mayhill will be followed by Oksana Semenik. Uh, she is an art historian, researcher, and journalist. Uh, she is in Kiev. Uh, she was uh, last year associated with the Zimmerli Art Museum at Rutgers University, and it was this experience um, kind of spurred her activism um, and creating a Twitter account called Ukrainian Art History which focuses on topics that include decolonizing American European museums, uh, particularly focusing on Ukrainian art and artists that have been labeled or identified as Russian. Uh, Oksana will be followed by Rostislav Semkiv, who is an associate professor at the Department of Literary Studies at the Kiev Mohila Academy. He's also directed the Smoloskip Publishing House. He has published an in, in, in array of uh, 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 journals and newspapers, including Kritika, which is published in Kiev, as well as Tsarkola a newspaper. Um, he publishes reviews. Um, he is also a talented uh, uh, translator of fiction and nonfiction books, as well as an author himself, and um, is a member of the Ukrainian Pen Center. Um, and is doing his utmost to kind of uh, uh, incorporate um, uh, uh, Ukrainian writers and, and question uh, writers whom Russia tries to appropriate. And um, we also are welcoming back Maria Sonovitsky, who is also a Yatsnik postdoctoral fellow. She's currently a professor at anthropology and music at Bard College. Uh, her research focuses on post-Soviet Ukraine, but not only. 
Um, she looks at Ukrainian punk music, Crimean Tatar music, Soviet children's music, um, also the effect of kind of the uh, nationalization of music following uh, the Chernobyl nuclear catastrophe. Um, she is also a performer, singer, a musician, um, and uh, she is the author of the book Wild Music, Sound and Sovereignty in Ukraine, also University of Toronto Press 2019, which won the Lewis Lockwood Award for, from the American Musicology, Musicological Society. She's published in a wide variety of journals. Um, and with that, I am going to close and turn over the mic to Mayhel. Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Hang on. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for having me on this panel for this incredibly important um, discussion. Um, I'll start by saying the title sort of threw me, um, Russia's Cultural Imperialism Towards Ukraine. Uh, we know Russia uses its cultural institutions both to fund its war and propagandize Russian culture, and we know they target Ukrainian culture, institutions, and people. Culture is a field and a weapon of war. We know this. But I don't work on Russia. And I've spent um, over a year, as I'm sure my colleagues have as well, trying to get audiences to focus not on Russia, but on Ukraine, on the particularity of culture in this place, and the importance of place in any cultural analysis. So I will gesture to Russia at the end of my remarks, but I want to begin with Ukraine and explain why talking about my own area of study, theater in Ukraine is so difficult. Why do we, and by we, I mean the general public of scholars in our region, obviously this Zoom audience excluded, um, why do scholars know so little about theater in Ukraine, about such an important aspect of Ukrainian culture? The answer is empire. Walter Mignolo, among other scholars of decoloniality, the condition of engaging in the praxis of moving beyond coloniality, writes of the geopolitics of knowledge, arguing how colonial difference shaped knowledge structures and epistemology itself. The empire creates universal concepts which erase the particularity of the knowledge of the colonized, or which make the knowledge of the colonized particular, niche, and not worthy of scholarly attention. So why is the artistic culture of Russia's empire and the Soviet empire so well known, so lauded, and that of Ukraine so ignored, becoming a footnote, if anything at all, to the story of the Russian arts? This is a direct consequence of power structures that continue to privilege the empire. So right now, I'm actually co-editing a volume of Ukraina Moderna on theater and film with Yulia Kisla. Um, if anyone wants to contribute, please let me know. And I needed to come up with scholars who study theater in Ukraine. So in Ukraine, there are many, of course. But outside Ukraine, it really struck me how there's not a lot. <laughs> and certainly not a lot of people compared to the many scholars who have worked on theater in Russia or the RSFSR. So there are just not people devoting their careers to this topic because, I would argue, it doesn't fit in the structures of knowledge that lead to publications and grants and jobs. And what that means is that students don't learn about Ukrainian theater, texts are not translated, and knowledge is not produced. So the epistemic violence, this epistemic violence in academia, in knowledge, only repeats the Soviet violence that reduced all non-Russian cultures to folk denying the specificity and the importance of the region. But let us here embrace a new geopolitics of knowledge. I want to look at how theater in Ukraine developed against empire, resisting empire, in the conditions of empire. So what I'm gonna do is offer sort of a counter narrative, a different narrative of theater in this region from the 19th to the 21st centuries in like 10 minutes. So um, let's do that and let's begin with Maria Zankovatska, a 19th century diva of the Ukrainian stage. In the late 19th century, the Russian Empire, in case you don't know, prohibited the publication and performance of the Ukrainian language. But to make a long story short, a group of ex-military got together and started doing professional Ukrainian language theater in the 1880s 
working around these prohibitions and a really interesting story. They had to write an entire repertory because of a censorship stipulation that European or Russian plays could not appear in Ukrainian translation on the stage. And moreover, censorship stipulated that anything in Ukrainian could only depict rural life. So they wrote a repertory of plays about rural life. They wrote plays about the failures of emancipation and the struggles of the post-emancipation village. And actually, um, through their theater, however melodramatic the plays may be, we do learn a lot about the challenges of village life in this period. Violence, class, property, and women losing out each and every time. As we know, this was the Teatr Karafeyev, and Maria Zankovatska was its star. They were wildly successful. Even while performing for the Tsar in St. Petersburg during a time when they were prohibited from performing in the Kiev region. And it was on this trip that Zankovetska posed for the photographer who was taking photos for the Russian edition of Darwin's Expressions of Emotions in Humans and Animals. She could have stayed in the imperial capital, she was invited to stay, but she preferred to go home. This group of artists, including Zankovetska, were devoted to place, to Ukrainian lands, Ukrainian audiences. They carved out a belonging in and despite empire. Now, today we might critique this Karifei repertory as a product of censorship, um, oppression, inability of the Ukrainians to speak, to paraphrase Spivak, but despite all that, they did speak. And they created plays that resonated with their audiences. There is no denying that the Karifei were extremely popular. Think of everyday Ukrainians coming from villages to mid-sized towns to see these shows being able to hear stories in their own language and stories that, again, although wildly melodramatic, clearly in some way were their stories. I'll add, of course, that Zankovatska herself resisted the patriarchy to pursue a career when women of her class just did not do that, making choices that were against all conventions of her time. But the Karifei remain unknown, absolutely unknown, outside Ukraine. Now, what if we put them at the center of our study of 19th century theater. In theater history, the 19th century in this region is generally about Stanislavski, the Moscow Art Theater, moving into the 20th century with Mayer Holt. But if we focus on the Karifei, we might see the ways military life shaped the arts in the wars at the end of the 19th century leading up to World War I. Or we might see the ways that imperial minorities actually created new audiences. In fact, both Yiddish and Ukrainian theaters created these repertories despite censorship. I wonder if this story of itinerant troops of Jews and Ukrainians weaving between each other, speaking to regional audiences, might actually be more significant than Stanislavski and his company touring on trains. Stanislavski, it is said, shaped American theater, but just as significantly did Yiddish theater. Stella Adler, who translated Stanislavski for an American audience, was the daughter of Yiddish theater stars from Odessa, Sarah and Jacob Adler, after all. Focusing on the Karifei makes Stanislavski fade. He becomes one story among many of people trying to make a career in the empire. So let's skip forward and talk about the subject of my first book, Les Kurbas and Berizy. As you know, in the 1920s, this was the largest state-funded theater in Soviet Ukraine in the capital, Kharkiv, and it was extraordinary. Yet it remains known largely only to Ukrainian specialists or to Ukrainians. I cannot emphasize this enough. People who just study the region in general do not know about Kurbas and the Berezil. This is because of a long legacy of focus by scholars solely on Moscow, Leningrad, St. Petersburg, and considering art produced in other places derivative. This is my favorite show. It's actually not directed by him, but by his three protégés, all of whom would be major figures in theater in Soviet Ukraine, even after Kurbas's murder in 1937. This is the first ever Ukrainian musical review, Hello from Radio 477. It was inspired by cabaret shows in Berlin, where they went in the late 1920s. They saw shows, including um, at a cabaret called Scala, known for its line of dancing girls, you can kind of see in this photograph here. Um, and they also brought lighting equipment, which you can see here that was used in this show. So it was a European cultural product, but it was also pure Soviet Ukrainian, including jokes about Moscow of several kinds, but basically always sort of making fun of Moscow, thinking they know everything when they don't. Um, that is this show positions itself, its place as the center. 
It was also unlike anything in all of the USSR that I've seen, by the way. Here, um, you can see um, local literary, on the picture on the right, local literary celebrity, Ostav Vishnya. He's played by an actor and he's going hunting and he runs into a group of um, girls dressed as dancing ducks and he's gonna shoot them, which is bad. So Baba Yaga comes out of her hut, which you can see here, and imprisons him in a bottle of Vishnyak or cherry brandy. Um, and he ends up at a jazz club and there's an aria to an owl and to alcohol. It's utterly strange, but it's a totally local theatrical product telling a local story. And in that, it is resisting the pull to the center so typical of imperial culture. It's actually, I would say, a post-colonial moment. Um, think about it. This was after empire. This was after the collapse of the Russian empire. And all of these artists were making art in what they believed was this post-imperial space. Um, so they were playing here with this sort of center in Moscow and regions in Ukraine, but of course they were playing with that. They all knew they were at the center, right? And so they're playing this um, relationship of colonized and colonizer um, in a really creative and interesting way. Because of course, in 1929, when this show was produced, it wasn't yet clear that Moscow did not want to allow Soviet Ukraine to be anything other than another little Russia. Beyond that Azil, I'd like to highlight another aspect of theater in this golden age of Soviet Ukraine, which is the Yiddish theater. So most scholars of theater only know about um, Solomon Mikhoyls, really big figure, and his company, Gosset, but they were actually a niche company in Moscow. The heartland of Yiddish theater was here in Soviet Ukraine. There was a Yiddish division of the Theater Institute and a Yiddish puppet theater that won second place in an all-union puppet competition. Um, and moving from one to four completely state-sponsored Yiddish language troops. Um, this fact reminds us of the multi-ethnicity of Soviet Ukraine in this region, which I think is one of its markers and one of the key features shaping cultural production. Um, some directors crossed over between theaters, some designers did. I think there was mutual inspiration. This show is from the Yiddish theater. It's a play called Schlack, The Little Devils. And you can see in this sort of line of girls Right, it's very similar to Hello. It has that kind of modern, jazzy, European influence feel. Um, I don't know its story. Um, I don't have archival material on it, but clearly there's some resonance between these shows. And I think there's a larger argument here about the benefits of diversity. In fact, I think Ukraine is a case study in the ways that diversity impacted artists to shape their creativity, creating shows like Schleck and Hello from Radio 477. So despite the homogenization of Soviet culture, the ways that it had this sort of centripetal force pulling everything to the center, it had to fit ideological norms. What unfolded in Soviet Ukraine reflected its own audiences. So think about this. What if we included Kurbas in wider studies on Soviet or indeed East European theater? We might see how diversity matters in theatrical production, how creativity can come from imperial borderlands as much, if not more so than centers. We might see a larger trajectory of theatrical practices from Habsburg Vienna and Polish modernism that took root here in Ukraine and could be of interest to scholars of, of those theatrical trends. That Kurbas remains so unknown to scholars of 20th century theater is a consequence of the violence of categories, the erasure of the centrality of the so-called periphery. So finally, I'll skip again um, to wartime, but actually pre-February 2022. Another specificity to this place that is today Ukraine is the transformation of cultural infrastructure that was successful in the post-Soviet period. Unlike in Russia, Ukraine actually, after 1991, quite seriously cut a lot of funding to the arts. What that meant was that people created um, innovation. They created new workarounds, co-productions, grants, um, new ways of thinking about the audience. In 2015, MP Irina Podolyak put through a package of legislation that changed the structure called the theater laws, um, which basically brought a whole new generation into leadership in the theater. There's a lot of challenges with this legislation, but it really brought a sort of um, a new set of people in and new stories that were being told. Um, and of course, new institutions like the Ukrainian Cultural Fund, Ukrainian Institute, decentralization politically, which is a huge topic of research, also meant decentralization culturally, so theaters received more funding from local city councils. 
This new cultural infrastructure shaped what stories could be told. Unlike in Russia, where theater had to rely on between the lines and subtext, in Ukraine, theater could speak directly, and it did. This resists the pull of post-Soviet Russia, post-Soviet empire. Um, this is the former Soviet army theater. Actually, you could not think of a more Soviet cultural institution. The former Soviet army theater in Lviv, which is now a very cool Ukrainian language theater called Teatr Lesi, with a very activist artistic team doing really important work. So what if we paid attention to how Ukraine and Russia had completely divergent paths in the last 30 years? We might want to include other cases. We could think about the factors that lead to radically different outcomes for the relationship between the state, society, and the arts. But the study of Ukrainian theater has been sidelined in two ways in the last 30 years. It's relegated to the periphery in the study of Russian Soviet theater, merely some sort of national folk theater or secondary mayor hold. And it's also sidelined by Eastern Europe and Europe because somehow it's too Soviet. So Ukraine kind of falls away. But this story of the last 30 years is, I think, really important and crucial for understanding the rich response in theater to the war today. And that response is different than in Russia. These are my final remarks. Let's take a peek at the Russian occupied regions of Ukraine. In fact, the Donetsk Music and Drama Theater is still operating. Um, it never stopped operating. There are even a few actors who've been named People's Artists of the DNR, and their website lauds the fact, as we see here, that they were able to perform in Mariupol for the first time since 2014. They performed a strange play from 1958 called Two for the Seesaw by William Gibson, which is a really strange choice and oddly a staple of very Soviet repertory. The Black Sea Fleet Theater in Sevastopol is still in operation, serving the troops in Russian-occupied Crimea. On the main stage, there's nothing of the war. This lack of war repertory is also striking at the drama theater in Luhansk, except for this one-off show about Luhansk as a city of heroes. And in Russia, there are plays of war, even if not directly about this one. There's War and Peace at the Vaktangov, or at the theater of the Russian army in Moscow, a new production of a play called Barabanchitsa, The Little Drummer Girl, which is a play from the 1950s um, that became the touchstone production for theater of the Carpathian Military District, now Teatr Lassi. Um, and it's a classic of the Soviet military repertory performed nowhere except Russia and Belarus. So the silence on the war from Russian theater is quite simply deafening. Again, studying divergent past since 1991 explains that silence and yet the polyphony from Ukraine. So what I've tried to do here is focus on place, challenging our geopolitics of knowledge. Because what is important is thinking about how stories emerge, who hears them and the power that they have to shape our understanding of the world. What stories will be told of this war and who will hear them? Thinking critically about how stories of theater have been historically so dominated by empire, both physically and epistemologically, I think helps us grapple with the necessity of supporting Ukrainian theater artists now as they tell stories and the necessity of creating space for new stories and to make sure that these stories of war do not get subsumed into Russia and that the centrality of this place and its theater always remains in focus. Thank you. Thank you, May Helena. Um, I, I'm sure we're going to be returning to, yeah, it was excellent, <laughs> super. Um, themes of place and decentering, benefits of diversity. Um, and I'm thinking, and, and categories, and I think this kind of will connect very well right now with Oksana, because I think she's very much focused on categories um, and trying to um, dispel kind of um, this homogenization of, of, of artists uh, being subsumed into kind of imperial narratives. And, and I think she will definitely speak to place. Um, so Oksana, over to you, please. Uh, thank you for your introduction and thank you, Mayhill, for your great presentation. It was super interesting. Um, now I'm trying to show my presentation. Yep. Um, so once again, 
my name is Oksana Semenik. I'm art historian and the colonial activist and author of Twitter account Ukrainian Art History. Um, and what I'm trying to do is research in European and American museums, uh, museum collections, and try to change uh, wrongly um, wrong attribution of Ukrainian artists. Um, and uh, the last successful case was um, changing the nationality of uh, Repin, of Illa Repin and uh, Arhip Kuinji. Um, and the and the name of the ga dancers from Russian dancers to um, dancers in Ukrainian dress um, in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. So um, I'm gonna start my presentation with um, question and answers to it. Um, why you don't know many names of Ukrainian artists? And by you, I mean not just um, art historians and specialists and people from different countries, but also um, Ukrainians, because um, Ukrainian art history still have this um, colonial and Soviet um, um, colonial and, and Soviet um, narratives in art history. Um, which we're trying to um to to work with to destroy and to decolonize um so first of all um yeah and then i will explain how they actually were appropriated um because many of ukrainian artists they were appropriated by russian art history and, uh, for example, Ilya Repin, uh, Kazimir Malevich, and Oleksandr Ekster, um, because, um, and, you know, it started um, many years ago, um, as, and, but um, why they actually, um, how they appropriated this artist, I will tell more um, a little bit later, but, um, What's common uh, about them is that uh, they were they lived in Russia or they studied in Russia, but um, they spent Russia spent a lot of money to um, uh, to different exhibitions, uh, researches, books, etc., uh, etc., et to make them Russian artists. Um, the other problem, um, well, not a problem, but um, the second case is that many Ukrainian artists immigrated or, um, or assimilated in different countries um, because difficult political or social situation in Ukraine uh, during Russian Empire or Soviet period. Um, for example, Sonia Delone, uh, she moved to France when she was a little girl, um, but we know that she had strong connection with Ukrainian artists, uh, for example, Alexandra Ekster, and um, she wrote um, how Ukrainian traditional culture um, affected and influenced her art. Um, for example, you know, this, um, her, her, um, art style simultaneism, sorry. Um, the second uh, example um, is uh, Jakub Gnizdowski, uh, who well-known American uh, artist. Well, he Ukrainian-American, but he will known in uh, America because in the United States, because he moved there after Second World War. Um, and uh, this is interesting case about uh, him that uh, he was born in Ternopil region. Um, and it was, this part of Ukraine was part of Austro-Hungarian empire. But you will never uh, learn about that because usually Jakub Gnizdowski in different museums, he just born in Ukraine, not in some empire. 
Um, and the other uh, artist is uh, Volodymyr Baranov Rosine. In different museums, uh, he attributed as Russian artist. For example, that was in the Zimmerli Museum where I worked and uh, researched their collection. Um, and now they're gonna change that in their museum system. And the second problem is um, actually repressions because many Ukrainian artists were just killed, um, especially during Soviet period. And there is two examples. It's a uh, art group of uh, Boychukis. Um, and the second one is the artist who, um, they were working uh, during the 60s. Uh, so we call them Shisdesatniki. Um, and uh, you can see here Alla Horska, uh, this young and strong woman. Uh, she was a monumental artist, but uh, she was brutally killed by KGB in the 60s because of her uh, Ukrainian positions and uh, because of uh, because she was against uh, Soviet government and uh, she, she was part of um, dissident um, movement. And actually what's interesting between these two different groups that first, um, that's actually common, first is that Boychukis and uh, the artists of the 60s, they were trying to work with the uh, previous generations of Ukrainian artists. So Boychukis, uh, they were um, influenced by uh, Byzantine school, uh, so by the art of uh, Kyiv Rus uh, period, uh, Kyivska Rus, um, and the 60s, they were actually influenced by Boychukis because um, you can see here this, um, uh, this monumental work uh, that now is in the occupied territory. It's in Luhansk region. So we don't know if, if this work even exists. Um, so they had the strong generational connections between each other. Um, and even, um, and the other thing that happened uh, that Russian um, Soviet government, they were trying to destroy all works. Uh, so we know just not so many works of Boychukis. Um, we just have them thanks to um, Yaroslava Muzika, who basically hid uh, the works of Boychukis between the walls, and Oksana Pavlenko, who moved to Moscow to teach there in the local university, and she survived these repressions. And that's what's interesting. Uh, so it was the same time, uh, it was 30s, but in the, um, in the Moscow, uh, she survived. She, 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 you know, she, she could work. She could, um, uh, she could do her art, uh, and in the same time, in Ukraine, all her friends were just repressed and killed. Um, so, how actually the empire was appropriating Ukrainian art? Um, First of all, if uh, you will see some uh, Ukrainian artists in the world museums um, and they attribute it as Russian, that's probably also because of uh, their education in the art academy in St. Petersburg. And we should understand why they choose to uh, learn, uh, why they choose to study in this academy because first of all, it was the only one academy and um, it was, um, and because they provided scholarships to study and work at Europe, for example, Dmitro Levitsky and uh, Volodymyr Borovikovsky, um, they studied in St. Uh, Petersburg and they had chance to work with the wealthy families. Um, 
just because you know it's the case of actually money and uh and this possibility to work and uh, the other case is that um many of these artists they got scholarships to travel or to study or work in the europe and for example ivana ivazovsky um he worked in italy for a couple of years which is actually funny because if you will compare uh, he <laughs> he traveled around europe almost uh, the same years that he lived in russia because for all his life uh, he lived in crimea um and not in russia um but why he's Russian? Because of the academy. And Arhip Guinji, for example, he was very popular in Paris and he had exhibitions there. Um, and it's all thanks to academy. Um, the other problem was that in the Russian Empire, all uh, identities or other identities and languages and cultures uh, than Russian were, uh, were forbidden. Uh, so if you're going somewhere for exhibition or for a concert, um, I don't know, or for a study, um, you will be considered as Russian because you're from Russian Empire. So there were no um, other um, other nationalities, or you will be considered as uh, like a small Russian, as they called uh, Ukrainians. And that's why things like these names of um, the gas works happened, because even, even that we see that they have Ukrainian dresses, very typical ones, uh, even, you know, everything. And we know that it was, um, um it was some concert uh, from from the russian empire because actually they had the strong connection between french empire and russian empire uh in a cultural way and we still see that connection um the other uh really big and important problem is looting is uh, stolen art and it's happened, uh, and it's not just the case of the last year looting from Kherson Art Museum. Uh, so it's not started from the full scale invasion. It started centuries ago from the Russian Empire and from the Soviet Union. Um, for example, if we are talking about some archaeological researches in the Crimea, um, they took everything to the Hermitage, uh, which is typical imperial museum as Louvre or Metropolitan or British Museum. And then if some other museums, um, they bought some works or artifacts or art, um, it's considered as Russian because the people from that museum wrote like that that is russian um so that's why many artifacts in the museums right now for example at louvre they have some artifacts from crimea but it says that it's a, a russian collection and during the soviet uh, period when the bolsheviks came to power and stole many works from ukrainian museums um or other common uh, practice was to take works from for exhibition for some exhibition in Moscow or whatever, but and they never return. Um, and even uh, Ukrainian museum curators they ask to return these works after independence, but Russian colleagues refuse to do that. Um, so that's why we don't have many works of such well-known artists as Malevich or Exter, for example, and we can't research them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really hard to do because also um, important archives are now in Russia and there is no change, chance to get them and to work with them. Um, and this is, and the other big problem is that 
mythology, I, I call, call, uh, call them like that, um, of the Russian avant-garde, because here we see two popular books about Russian avant-garde um, with names like Chagall, Lisitsky, and Malevich, and they are not Russian. <laughs> Chagall is from Belarus. Uh, Lisitsky also have, uh, he's from Jewish family as Chagall, but uh, he studied in Ukraine and lived there. Um, and Malevich from the Polish family. Sana, um... You're frozen, so um, I'm not sure. Oh, now you're okay. I, I see a little movement. Um, so we may- Praise that you heard. Oh, the, okay, there you are. Sorry, I'll try to reconnect, maybe. You're okay now, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, Good. please. Uh, and, yeah, if you can, um, if, I don't know how much, uh, you have two, three more minutes? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just... Um, no, it's good now. My, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so Alexandra Exter is uh, a good case to, um, to explain uh, how this propaganda and how this uh, Russian art history and Russian appropriation works. So she was born in uh, Poland in a Jewish family, but her father was from Belarus and mother from the Greece. Um, she moved to Kiev when she was three years old and she studied in art school in Kiev uh, with Bohomazov and Archipenko. And it was her, the only one like official um, art education because of course she um, she had um, you know many connections with uh, avant-gardian artists and with modernists uh, as uh, Picasso um, in Paris but um, yeah and she worked with traditional Ukrainian artists and with traditional Ukrainian art um, from 1920 to 1924, she lived in Moscow or even less and died in, pa and then um, she immigrated to Paris and uh, lived there um, to her death. So all her life um, in Ukraine, uh, called Kyiv period, but four years in Moscow called... Uh, <laughs> But because four years in Moscow, um, Russian art historians and uh, after them art historians from Europe or U United States called her Russian artist just because this four years in Moscow. And what uh, Russian art historians usually use is um, to call these periods not Ukrainian or not Ukrainian school, not Ukrainian artist, but they use the names of the cities like Kiev, Odessa, uh, Vitebsk, etc. Um, yeah, and I don't have, I, I realized that I don't, I don't have uh, a lot of time, but um, among wrongly attributed artists are Malevich, Exter, Repin, Borovikovsky, Levitsky, Maria Senyakova, Archip Kuinji, Abraham Manevich, uh, John D. Graham, he's from Ukraine, Todros Geller, Nathan Altman, and many, many others. And the other problem is that um, is the actually not even a nationality, but a correct name of the country and uh, it's all examples from uh, Smithsonian American Art Museum, where you can see different versions of uh, um, Ukraine and how to call it. For example, Ukraine in Russia or um, USSR, um, Hnizdovsky, who is just from Ukraine, and they have many, um, th they have many, 
uh, problems like that call in Odessa, Russia, Kharkiv, Russia, Kamenets-Podilsky, Russia, etc., etc. And uh, when we were talking uh, about that problem, because um, uh, because um, yeah, I sent them all this uh, the list of this uh, wrongly attributed artist. And they said that probably they should write Russian Empire or Soviet Union. And why it's not correct? Because we don't use uh, former British Empire about India. We don't say Spanish artists, meaning artists who was born in Colombia during Spanish rule and etc. Cetera, et cetera. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> That's Thank all. you, Oksana, for uh, such a wonderful presentation and the important work you are doing. And I, I know that we all uh, share in, in commending this this project um, because I I growing I grew up in Washington D.C. and it went to all the national museums in the U.S. and was always very frustrated by. Um, lack of consistency, um, so so thank you. Um, Rostislav, I hope you can pick up on some of the problems that uh, were presented by Oksana, you know, uh, you know, the, the, on education, imperialism, the stealing or looting of culture, the mythologies, um, as it pertains to literature. So over to you. Um, thank you, dear colleagues, thank you for all these uh, brilliant presentations and uh, of course thanks to Oksana that uh, she fights with these museums yes to change um, the um, uh, naming of uh, Ukrainian artists uh, appropriated by the empire and thank uh, for the possibility to present several of my thoughts on Russian colonial strategies which were enabled in Ukraine, uh, though were not maybe easily spotted and even could work until now. It is uh, understandable that the empire overtly appropriated many of Ukrainian writers, authors, artists, uh, etc. Uh, for example, even nowadays in Russian Wikipedia, we can read about Mykola Hohol as Russian writer Nikolai Hohol, and about Rehori Skovoroda as Russian and Ukrainian philosopher, uh, though he had not any attitude to Russian culture and spent more time in Europe than in St. Petersburg. All these examples uh, are fully understandable in terms of post-colonial studies, of course. Several months ago, during the virtual conference hosted by Lviv Franco uh, University, famous contemporary historian Timothy Snyder mentioned that postcolonial studies work appropriately only in case if both parties, the former colony and the former metropolis, are ready to critical revaluation of their part, uh, past and constructive reconstruction of the contemporary and future uh, mutual cooperation. As we know now, it doesn't work in case with Russians they did preserve the imperial plans and uh, prepare for the invasion. Um, nowadays, uh, we witness the incredible growth of Ukrainian self-conscience. Many people who search for their true origin start to speak Ukrainian and fight the legacies of the colonial culture influences. Meanwhile, several colonial strategies remain hidden. In fact, many colonial strategies remain hidden and tend to remain undiscovered. It is so crucially important to pay attention uh, to these uh, dangerous issues and avoid these tendencies in future. Um, these three issues I want to stress are not really connected except the general attitude towards the post-colonial situation. But I'm eager to disclose them and stress the importance uh, of their improvement and avoidance. Of course, they are all connected with literature or um, literary market to some extent, yes. Um, here are these issues. First of all, our translation is still in uh, many cases colonial. Our research is definitely mostly colonial, 
and even our humor till the latest time was colonial. Let me explain. First, uh, even during the latest 10 years, we witnessed several real scandals connected with the so-called colonial translation. I will not be uh, very specific about the details, but for example, a few books by Stephen King, for example, Eat, Pet Cemetery, were not translated from the original, but from Russian translations. This way of the translation has a long history in our culture. For example, in the end of the 15th of the 20th century, famous Ukrainian translator and dissident Mykola Lukash started his own translation of Don Quixote by Miguel Cervantes because the novel was first translated into Ukrainian in 1955 by Vasil Kozachenko and Yevhen Krotevich from Russian translation by Nikolai Lubimo. Uh, I guess it won't be an exaggeration to say that the great part of translations into Ukrainian during 60s until 19th uh, of the 20th century were made through Russian. The colonial mechanism here is clear. The metropolis uses its consolidated resources and organized wide programs of translation into its own language. Now, it is assumed that there is no use to perform separate translations into colonial languages. The bearers of a colonial culture are deprived of the possibilities to translate and either tend to use a metropolitan translation or translate from it. Uh, this way, all the main books of the world literature appear in colonial culture through the culture of and language of a metropolis. Thereafter, the colonial culture uh, loses the possibility and also the motivation to perform separate translations and accordingly lacks qualified translators. The problem still exists as the Ukrainian market of the translation still uh, 2014 was not profitable, as a bulk of translation were still performed in Russia and imported to Ukraine with low taxes. In 2014, the, important, uh, the import was abruptly stopped and the Ukrainian translation market started to develop. Uh, still, we do lack of professional translators and thus uh, low qualified ones attempted to use Uk Russian translations to make their work easier. Uh, so that was about colonial translation and then uh, colonial research. Uh, the colonial research uh, that perhaps remains our greatest problem till now in humanitarian uh, sciences means the usage of uh, mainly Russian sources in uh, humanitarian area. Many courses in Ukrainian universities are still uh, based on Russian bibliographies uh, not balanced by any uh, other ones. Thus, the majority of sources used in the curriculum of our universities are Russian. This is understandable as most professors, especially the elder ones, were educated still in Soviet times and then instructed their PhD students with the sources they know. This way, the research horizon of the majority of our scholars is limited to Russian sources or the sources of Russian translation, in Russian translations. Once again, the metropolitan culture controls the scope of Ukrainian access to knowledge and the limits, uh, and, the limits um, and limits the perspectives for its development. And the third aspect uh, about the post-colonial humor um, lies in completely another area, not practical as uh, first two, but uh, that's phenomenological one. I speak about it because it connects with my long time research of humor in Ukrainian literature uh, in post-colonial perspective. My most daring conclusion is that in this research is that a metropolis, while performing the control of a colonial culture, also tries to control its humor. Laughter can easily be uh, turned into satire and satire can be directed against the ruling regime. Uh, this, that's why the metropolis absorbs the right for satire and rigidly repress uh, the colonial satirists, much more uh, than in its own literature. 
In Ukrainian history, our greatest poet and the greatest satirist of the 19th century, Taras Shevchenko, was imprisoned by Tsar Nikolai I, not for his historical course aggressors, but especially for his satires against the Tsarist true. And in 1933, when Stalin purges just where to begin, the whole editorial board of the only Ukrainian satirical magazine Chervoni Peretz, the Red Pepper, were arrested and executed or sent to exile. That's like an assault on Charlie Hebdo, but legally performed by the state. Finally, I uh, have the risky assumption that any empire deprives colonies uh, of the right for satire, and there are almost no satirists in colonial literature. At least we can observe this in Ukrainian literature. And only speakers of uh, metropolis have the possibility to produce satires. Of course, in colonial literatures, uh, there could appear anti-imperial satirists, but they will be illegal or persecuted and not numerous. At the same time, colonial literatures have the right for uh, harmless, not political humor. And we have a great number of those simply funny humorists in Ukrainian literature. At the same time, the metropolitan culture could be biased against this senseless humor uh, that doesn't perform serious function of mocking its ideological enemies. This way, uh, the general conclusion is that a metropolitan culture exaggerates satire and lacks humor. Colonizers don't laugh, they laugh at, at someone, and colony lacks satire but possesses humor. The colonial subalterns perhaps cannot speak, but they uh, should be merry, festive, and laugh all the year round. At least the imperial propaganda tends to depict them this way. At the same time, all modes of humor are possible and present in liberal societies. But in post-colonial ones, there is still an uh, inertial lack of satire, especially of the political satire. We need a special consolidation of self-consciousness to achieve the right to laugh over someone after a long break. It's a bit of paradox, but the war promoted this consolidation. And now, especially during the latest year, we witnessed a great number of satirical internet memes and jokes, verses, songs, and even already a few novels, satirical novels. We are now without any doubt present, present at the birth of uh, the new Ukrainian satire uh, that bravely laughs at the enemy, being uh, one more kind of our weapons. And this is one of the most vivid incidents of trespassing and destruction of the colonial legacies. So, thank you. Thank you, Rostislav, and thank you so much for, um, you know, uh, bringing out these important points about translation. I, I think that's, um, um, and, and, and the research models, but most importantly, the humor. Um, and uh, I'm sure that we're gonna have questions from the audience uh, for you. So, so participants may be thinking about some questions as we turn over to Maria and maybe she can uh, present what she was gonna present and pick up some of the threads that you've heard throughout. Uh, so over to you. Thank you. I um, am so inspired. I've just been jotting down what everyone has said. Um, and I wish that I was good enough to just riff, but I did take some notes. Um, and so I will respond uh, maybe indirectly, but I just wanna say that with satire, um, if I have time, I will show a tiny clip of the uh, Ukrainian punk uh, satirical uh, music video from 1989, because um, Rostislav, to your point, I was repeatedly told in interviews that the Komsomol, who were the censors at the time in this particular case, did not understand music, right? So they were good at, at censoring literary texts and much worse at censoring performance and sound. Um, okay, so I'm going to, like Mayhill, kind of try to get at the 19th century and the 20th century in a matter of 12 to 15 minutes. 
Um, and one of the things I really want to do here, and I think this really does link up to all of the broad themes and especially maybe to this idea of geopolitics of knowledge, I want us to think about the relationship of Ukraine to Russia in settler colonial terms. Um, and I think this can also help us possibly distinguish the relationship of the Russian empire as opposed to other imperial inheritances of Ukraine um, that held parts of uh, modern Ukrainian territory at different periods in history. So if we think of the Russian empire as a settler colonial regime, um, I think it can help us illuminate uh, why some of these dynamics are specific and worth emphasizing, um, not only because of the tragedy of the current moment. So I, in terms of thinking about music, I'm also going to engage uh, Eric Lott's very influential idea of love and theft. Um, this is a term from his 1993 book, which is titled Love and Theft. Um, that book is about blackface minstrelsy in the antebellum US and the white dominant white culture's appropriation of black music, speech and movement. Uh, for the benefit of overwhelmingly white and male audiences. So admittedly, this is a little bit of a stretch in terms of context, but I'm going to try to make a case that it applies. Um, this dialectic of love and theft that Lot lays out is, um, is a kind of dynamic interplay, right, of desire, envy, fear, entitlement, and guilt. And I do think this can really be helpful as we think through the ways Russian musicians have traditionally expropriated Ukrainian musical materials in the service of supremacist imperial ideologies in music, specifically the ideology of greatness. This is a very seductive and powerful ideology, especially in classical music. Um, so I wrote an essay for the San Francisco Opera last fall uh, and delved into a book of aphorisms published in Moscow in 1862, which contained a number of variations on this theme. And I apologize for using the slur, but I'm going to use it here because it appears in the original. Quote, a hohol is worth nothing, but their voices are good. Um, this is one of many iterations, right, on this kind of theme in this 1862 book. Um, and I think this pejorative stereotype, they're worth nothing, but their voices are good, right, opens a, up this portal into the logics of how a post-Catharinian settler colonialism depicted its ensurfed masses in Ukraine, um, especially in that ter territory, which they then referred to as, quote, Little Russia. Um, so thinking about settler colonialism a little bit more specifically, um, I want to engage Patrick Wolfe's incredibly well-known premise that settler colonialism operates as a system or a structure rather than an event. Um, and in this system, Native people are erased and often eliminated as a precondition for settlers to expropriate land and resources. So in this schematic, territory territoriality and this i'm quoting here quote territoriality is settler colonialism's specific irreducible element and so i do think when we think about the current conflict uh, we can see how territoriality is a major right goal of the russian invasion of ukraine i therefore think we can apply this framework here um central to wolf's idea is what he terms the logic of elimination and the organizing grammar of race. So I want to think about whether the hohol, this abject figure of in the ensurfed um, Ukrainian masses, uh, can be thought of as a slur that connotes a racialized hierarchy. So here's the provocation. Can we think about how the structures of imperial Russian culture sanctioned the, fe the fetish, the theft, and the desire for the songs of the Hohol, that otherwise abject figure whose unfree labor enabled Russian imperial society to reproduce itself. Um, there's a well-documented 19th century fetish of Ukrainian folk song, which contributes to the construction of the idea of Ukrainians as exceptionally musical. This is another stereotype shared in common with people racialized as black in the system of US chattel slavery, right? That Ukrainians are exceptionally musical little Russians, whose earthy folkiness um, kind of operates as a as an Russian imperial idea of noble savagery. Um, again, the hohol is worthless, but his voice is good. Um, furthermore, the logics of serfdom, which by the 19th century had 
come to pretty closely resemble the system of U.S. chattel slavery with some key differences, and I'm indebted to Peter Colton's book here, um, could also be rationalized in paternalistic lines. So in my essay for the San Francisco Opera, I wrote extensively about the first, uh, which scene is it actually? One of the opening scenes from Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin opera, which de depicts the benevolent ensurfed masses returning from the harvest. The master praises them for their excellent work and suggests maybe they would like to dance for her. And they're like, yeah, great. We're, we're thrilled about that. We would love to do a happy dance because we've just completed this backbreaking labor and now it's time to celebrate you. So this is a, I mean, you know, it just wouldn't fly in another context, right? This is not a story that we would tolerate anymore in the United States of America, but somehow in this case we do. Um, we can also, of course, think about musical borrowing in Tchaikovsky's um, many other works, including the notoriously titled Little Russian Symphony, Symphony Number no. 2 from, I think, 1872. Um, and because I don't have a lot of time, we're not going to go into other composers, but this is a long history that extends well into the 20th century. So returning to Lot's evocative phrase, how does the feeling of, quote, love, which is a condescending love, but it's still love, how does this feeling of love of Ukrainian song how did it allow those complicit in maintaining imperial hierarchies to believe that they were somehow allied with the Ukrainian peasantry, right? Absolving them of the responsibility of questioning the structural conditions of Russian settler colonialism. And then second, how does the li literal theft of Ukrainian melodies, especially folk songs believed to be authorless and therefore you know, most depicting the true authentic soul of the Ukrainian um, citizenry or peasantry at that point. Um, how does this theft of Ukrainian motifs, song structures, etc., contribute to the Russian imperial self-mythologization of its exceptional cultural greatness? And this reminds me of some of Oksana's points, right? This mythos, this mythology that reverberates strongly into the present. Um, so before we leave the 19th century, <laughs> oh my gosh, um, I just want to note that this, um, this really seductive messaging around, let's say, Tchaikovsky's greatness really left no room in the canon for anyone else. Definitely not a figure like Nikola Lysenko, who was in fact Tchaikovsky's contemporary. They were even on friendly terms. Um, and Nikola Lysenko has been fully excripted from the history of uh, classical, so-called classical music. Um, they were individuals who made radically different choices in the 19th century imperial culture. So Tchaikovsky, who supposedly has ancestry connected to a Cossack family with the surname Tchaika, um, was very closely affiliated with the Russian center of power. He fully got sucked in in that centripetal way that Mehil was describing and therefore accrued fame, right? The other figure, Mikola Lysenko, instead chose to identify with little Russians uh, that underclass um, and dedicated himself, in fact, to missionizing for Ukrainian music and culture and language, um, therefore becoming excluded from the halls of prestige and the durable canons of supposedly great composers. So we see in these diverging biographies, and I think this is really important, an element of choice, of volition. And the historian Fabian Bauman right now, I think, is doing very important work on historicizing this phenomenon in the 19th century in a really fabulous article published in Kritika in uh, 2022. Um, he describes how Kievan elites, even within one family, made diverging choices. Some of them chose to continue kind of um, with the path that would bring them greater riches and fame, and some chose to ally themselves with the Ukrainian cause. Um, and this really historicizes, I was so excited to read this article because it historicizes a phenomenon that I described in the conclusion of my first book, which is called Wild Music Sound in Sovereignty in Ukraine. And there I termed the phenomenon volitional citizenship and then connected it, given my focus on music, to this phenomenon of acoustic citizenship. And that concept is the feeling of belonging to a project of sovereignty on the basis of an affiliation with musical traditions and or practices. So we can think about the element of choice here. And I think this is also important for pivoting away 
from essentializing rhetorics, right? That I am, I have always been Ukrainian in the same way since time immemorial. It shows us some contingency, which is I think very important for understanding what we're witness to today. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna leap now to 1980s in Kyiv to a radically different time and place and genre. And I wanna talk for one moment here about um, Vopli Vidoplasova uh, or Veve, uh, the, the, the often called the first Ukrainian punk band, sometimes an ethno-punk band, um, who were radical in their time and place for singing some, about half of their repertoire in Ukrainian. This was in Kyiv at the time, quite radical. In a thoroughly Russified late Soviet Kyiv, it was also an ambiguous choice. And this is a huge debate. Uh, I have a book coming out about this literally on Saturday where I really dig into the debate. Um, but this ambiguity is very potent in triggering uh, this possibility of a choice for young nonconformists, neformale, who populated the so-called Kyiv underground and would come to see Vopli Vidoplasova and think like, Wait, is the Ukrainian language cool, right? Maybe for the first time in their lives. Um, and what I found incredibly moving in the course of the interviews I conducted between 2019 and 2022, all, all of which were done before the full-scale invasion, although I did follow-ups afterwards. So I just want to clarify, this is not all like, you know, intensified because of the full-scale invasion. Um, there were many ways in which people who had participated often centrally in that Tusovka, in that scene, um, appraised the impact of Veve back then. And so if we extend the idea of settler colonialism into the 20th century context of Ukraine and the 20th century history of mass population transfers further coheres with Wolf's model of settler colonialism, by the way, so we can think about Crimea, Donbass, and all of the other regions that were transformed through deliberate imperial technologies of population transfer. Veve, I think, allows us to think about the temporality of coming into awareness about having been colonized. And then secondly, finding strategies to decolonize. Veve, the original band members in that time in archival materials and in interviews with me up until 2022, rejected the idea that they were idea-driven nationalists. They just rejected that that was what was going on at the time. Uh, Sashko Pipa, that's his phrase, the original bass player. Um, but everyone testified to the fact that their music had a political effect. And so part of my project is to understand kind of how this highly ambiguous choice could still be understood as a political effect. I'm gonna wrap it up here. I'm gonna read for you a quote from Eugene Hutz, who is the frontman of Gogo Bordello, was at the time a teenage super fan of Veve in Kyiv, like 14, 15 years old. And I interviewed him for this project and he told me this. I apologize for the obscenity, but he's a rock star, so we'll, we'll allow it. He said, well, it's like this. I could see if you were coming from the guardian echelon of Ukrainian culture, that Veve's performances could spook you out because of its eccentricity and surrealistic take on things. Veve was, you know, a scandal. But you have to understand that at the time, these were also the guys who went to Moscow and blew everyone's minds off because they were singing in Ukrainian. It was a statement on behalf of Ukrainian culture. No one there perceived it as making fun of anything, just like, wow, this shit is for real. So I think it played a positive role, especially in Kyiv, you know, where at the time, and this is his voice, right? And it's sad to admit, but there were a lot of people who were drifting away from the understanding that Kyiv was a Ukrainian city. The Soviets did a lot of shit to fuck it up, you know? So having anything in Ukrainian, even if, if it had kitschy elements about it, was still positive. And you had kids with Trizube, with the national insignia of Ukraine, inside of their leather jackets, gathering around at the Kyiv Rock Club and discussing the topic, like, yo, this is my shit, <laughs> end quote. Um, so in these extremely complex and entangled histories, um, in this case through music, but I think in all of our cases, I don't think it's correct to resort to very simple stories. And I appreciate the ways in which everyone has rejected a simple narrative here. But I do think it's incredibly urgent to think about the ways in which the technologies of empire, of approximate empire, of a hostile empire as they always are, of a settler empire, can illuminate a long history of Ukrainian volitional citizenship. Thank you. Wow, uh, amazing presentations. And Maria, thank you so much for, you know, 
closing and bringing in all these threads. Uh, I am going to pause and wait for some questions from our audience, but while uh, people are thinking about what they would like to ask of you, perhaps you would like to engage with each other. So I will take, you know, a few seconds, count to the 10 to see if you want to unmute yourself and have a conversation. Mayhill, you look like you might want to. <laughs> well, I just, I mean, there's so many, I would just wish I could reach through and like hug everyone um, on this on this Zoom. Um, I loved all the resonances between what we were talking about. Um, Rostislav, your quote, um, your quote, colonizers don't laugh, they laugh at. Um, I think that's brilliant. And I think that's, um, that's so true and sort of so resonates with some of the work that um, I did in my book on this, this you know first Ukrainian musical review where they have all this humor um and Oksana I just really applaud you for all the for all the work that you're doing and um and it's sort of interesting to be and like see on Facebook there's actually a lot of pushback to the kind of work that Oksana is doing and people really pushing against it and it's sort of I think one thing that probably all of us have experienced is over the past year how hard it is to break some of these structures and walls down like it really continues to be um, um, a battle. And Maria, I just love this idea of volitional citizenship and your story of the 19th century. I think that's exactly what Maria Zankovatska and the Kurefe were doing. I mean, they chose to be a part of um, this Ukrainian world and they have been, as you said, excribed from history, right? Um, we don't know about them. And so how do we, how do we rectify that? So just thank, thanks all of you so much. Yeah, that was brilliant and very interesting and uh, of course it is very important to speak about brazil and um, uh, these uh, all things about uh, around it of course uh, brazil um, mainly brazil was a tragical theater yes they performed a very um, important tragic comedies yes by uh, mccola kulish uh, but it is very uh, characteristic, yes, that they uh, have this um, musical uh, in their repertoire, and it was very uh, popular. And uh, they, uh, this way, they were trying to absorb more audience, and they had this audience uh, through uh, these instruments, of course, and uh, uh, this gave them the possibility to. Uh, than to perform very serious things. Mm. Um, and, uh, that's uh, th that's a very uh, lovely combination um, uh, of uh, this popularity of trying to be popular and trying to say important things. Mm. Uh, this way, and they, they have uh, many uh, comic um, um, reprises episodes in their uh, serious uh, things, of course, uh, then to, to uh, take this, to make this balance. Uh, yes, and about then um, uh, what Oksana said, uh, that uh, it is interesting about um, uh, Repin, um, and we have very uh, important satirical man, perhaps, now, uh, when there are two uh, pictures of uh, Repin, uh, they, they are reproduced uh, side by side. Uh, one is about Burlakina Vol here, uh, where those uh, people are trying to, uh, to, to move this uh, hard bark, this hard vessel. Uh, and then uh, Cossacks that uh, are laughing, um, writing their letter to um, o o Osman uh, Sultan. And uh, so it is like a comparison of Russia and Ukraine, of uh, totalitarian Russia and democratic Ukraine. And uh, this, uh, this metaphor uh, is very important of the Cossacks uh, who uh, may be not so powerful, but they dare to uh, answer uh, to the very powerful, to the very powerful uh, sovereign, uh, to the very powerful um, to the great power, uh, they are not afraid. Um, I uh, produced such a little joke in my lectures uh, that saying that uh, Ukrainian uh, border guards, uh, when uh, answering the 
uh, Russian battleship, they produced a concise version of this letter of Cossacks to uh, Ottoman Sultan, yes, to, just to say that they are not afraid. And of course, it is very important to say about Vevé and about the uh, choice, the um, conscious choice of uh, the site, the, uh, the uh, want to, in, in fact, it was uh, something incredible when Wopri uh, Vedoplasova appeared. Uh, that was uh, something almost um, unbelievable. Uh, besides uh, with Brate Hadukin, a brother uh, Hadukin, yes. Uh, so uh, these two groups, they um, changed everything is in this um, early Ukrainian <laughs> independent uh, attitude to music. Uh, it is uh, very important. And the uh, possibility of this conscious choice, uh, it was uh, urgent uh, through the last two or three centuries because uh, these two, our main artists of the 19th century, Hohol and Shevchenko, they performed these two different choices. So Hohol cho uh, has chosen the popularity and for to, to achieve popularity, uh, he had to uh, converse to Russian language and to write in Russian and he became popular. And uh, Shevchenko, uh, I choose not to um, turn to Russian, though he was uh, advised to do this. But he was uh, so he he was even um, uh, told that uh, so uh, why to write this dead language? Uh, but he said that okay, that language uh, that language is enough for me. I'll write this uh, that Ukrainian language, of course. So uh, that's very important. Uh, choice that uh, almost everyone, artist uh, or writer, um, faced during uh, the Ukrainian uh, cultural history uh, since these two or even three centuries, because for Skovoroda it was a choice, uh, also a choice. So uh, he uh, was a singer of imperial uh, choir and uh, all uh, good singers from that choir uh, they made a brilliant career in uh, St. Petersburg and uh, he was strange to uh, leave and to return to Ukraine, uh, then to go to Europe. So never mind to these all uh, imperial temptations. So it's very important. So thank you all. If that was incredible and thank, interesting. Thank you. And I, I, I'm, I have a question, but I want to honor the, the, uh, the question from the audience. So we'll change a little kind of track here. Um, uh, first, I want to read the comment from Daria Prochotko that she doesn't have any questions, but found uh, the, the presentation super interesting, made lots of notes like we all did. And, uh, you know, writing as a Ukrainian by birth, but the product of Russian colonization. She speaks Russian, teaches Russian, but is coming home to her roots these days. And, and um, there were so many embedded messages that form our worldview. So a big, big thank you from Daria Prochotko. Um, in terms of a question we have from Professor Richard Arnold, um, uh, and I think all of you can probably touch on this because Cossack legacy crosses over into music and art and literature and history. Um, uh, how it's commemorated in Russia and Ukraine um, and fits into the idea of colonialism. In Ukraine, it seems a national archetype, but in Russia, it's a paramilitary movement. Uh, and uh, so Kazakh movement are taking part in hostilities. Is this a continuation of cultural appropriation and can the entire legacy of Kazakhs in Russia be a form of imperialism? So who would like to go first? Maria, did you? I'm happy to, if that's okay. <laughs> um, I can't answer the question probably fully comprehensively because it's a huge question, but I can speak a little bit to the legacy in music and popular culture. Um, and I just want to say that the stereotype, of course, of Ukraine, Ukrainians as Kozaki is also a Soviet stereotype, right? Like uh, one of the famous cartoons of the Soviet era was the Kozaki, the the Porish, the Kozaki, and um, and what I will speak to just briefly here because I think that this uh, this reminds me of one of Mayhill's points, right? Like if we compare 
the trajectories in the last 30 years, we do see this paramilitary movement, which is quite ethno-nationalistic and quite xenophobic in the kind of like Cossack um, paramilitary Russian side. Um, and in the Ukrainian side, we see a real diversity of practices. One of them that has interested me, and I wrote a short article for the LA Review of Books on this, was, was a kind of like ephemeral viral artifact, a music video made by uh, the YouTube sensation Jerry Heil, um, which repurposes a an 18th century Cossack song, which is all about, you know, Doroshenko protecting the land, basically. It name checks a number of Kozaki. In Jerry Heil's reimagining from April 2022, she changes the lyrics entirely to reflect the realities of the the immediate uh, post full scale invasion but she, she she uses the soviet cartoon in the video so she appropriates that for her own usages to make it a statement about the kind of cartoonish depiction of uh, the soviet ukrainian stereotype um and she rewrites the lyrics to include the modern day Kozaki, right? The modern day Ukrainian leadership. And this is already dated now because we know Arostovich is out of the picture, but he's one of the figures. But Zelensky, importantly, right? Vitaly Kim is the other one. And then Oleksiy Arostovich are the three Kozaki she names. And what's stro so striking to me about this is that no none of those three would have been included in the, in the Kozak project as we understand it in the 18th century, which was a very different project drawn around different lines. So to me, this was just this brilliant move, right? To sort of uh, update that history, make it really fun and catchy. It's a tremendously catchy song to listen to. I recommend everyone Google it. It's called uh, She incorporates Virka Sergyuchka, like it's high, low culture. It's just all over the place. And I think that tells us a little bit, right, about how the like practice and commemoration around Kozaki, this role of satire and humor, um, are very vibrant and alive in a way that they just aren't in the Russian case. So I, I would say that um, these are two different images in Ukraine, in Russia, because for Ukraine, uh, Kozaki, Kozaks, they are. Um, Primarily, the defenders of uh, Ukraine, of uh, old traditions, and we have a great number of uh, different uh, um, poems, novels, yes, uh, which are connected with this uh, image. Uh, but perhaps Kotlerevsky, with his Aeneid, with his uh, parody on uh, Virgil, uh, and many parodies were produced in Europe uh, through the 17th and 18th century. Um, so he uh, produced his own in the end of the uh, 18th century, and uh, he uh, produced the uh, exemplary image of uh, the Cossack, uh, who is very, uh, again, um, uh, merry and uh, is going to win in any circumstances. So uh, that's, uh, um, um, and that's something very interesting because he wrote this, uh, his great poem, uh, just uh, in uh, two and a half uh, decades after uh, Zaporizhska siege, the, um, uh, the, the fortress of uh, Cossacks were ruined by uh, Tsaritsa uh, Katerina. Uh, so he uh, produced this powerful image and then uh, it was developed in uh, further in literature. Uh, so it is very national national image. Uh, for Russia, uh, Cossacks, uh, they are just um, uh, something very marginal, uh, those th uh, who protect um, the margins, the borders. And uh, maybe two main texts uh, were uh, very uh, important. So that's uh, Cossack, uh, Cossacks by uh, Leo Tolstoy, uh, this, uh, the, the short novel, mm, uh, and then Tichy Don, uh, Quiet Don by uh, Mikhail Sholoho. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, but in all these, um, in all Russian perhaps literature, uh, that's the image of um, very autonomous uh, society. The Cossack society, for them, it's very autonom autonomous, something like um, the, the people of the borderline, the people of the frontier. 
and they have their own policies they have their own customs they are perhaps uh, maybe uh, not so open for anyone who come from uh, within uh, but they they are very uh, they are quite uh, they are urged to be very um, perhaps even cruel to all the invaders yes perhaps for chechens uh, who invades uh, this uh, Russian lands. Uh, so uh, that's very, uh, quite an important image, but not the central one as for Ukrainian culture, where it is uh, crucially important and uh, um, perhaps one of the most um, important uh, images for the self-consciousness. And even now, yes, you, <clears throat> Maria, you, um, uh, remember these uh, several songs and there is a song about that uh, Cossacks are coming uh, Probas and Hardy that's a group of uh, drum and bass or something like this and uh, they are singing the, uh, they are singing about the uh, Ukrainian army but they are using this narrative that Cossacks are coming they are coming to protect they are coming to defend Thank you, Rostislav. Okay. We're at time, but uh, we can go over a little bit. So I want to just, if, if Oksana, uh, perhaps from the perspective of art or Mayhill from, from you, wanted to add anything, um, we can give you a minute or so, Oksana. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to add, um, Maria uh, said about this image of Cossacks during Soviet times when it was. Um, like something unserious, not even connected to the history. Uh, and I remember the this um, many monumental works, uh, mosaics uh, in Ukraine, where you can see this, um, like some boy and girl, uh, like Cossacks. And uh, I realized that um, during the Soviet period, uh, this imperial power they turned um, this image not to uh, from something uh, historical and glorious, but to this Sharovarshina, um, as we call it. Uh, so they took this image and um, created from it something hilarious, something not serious, not, um, you know, like this is Ukraine, not. Um, but without any connections to the uh, history even. And, um, but uh, Rostislav uh, said about uh, any uh, by Kotlerevsky. And one of the, I think, greatest um, art projects, if we can say that, uh, illustration to any by uh, Basilevich uh, in uh, 60s, it's, it's just an amazing uh, illustrations, and um, he, um, it was even, um, so th this book, it has uh, two versions, uh, first one uh, censored, and the second one, um, like, without any censorship, with uh, even, like, erotical uh, images, with naked people, uh, which, of course, was forbidden during Soviet times. Um, and um, and I think it's really important how he turned uh, this uh, image um, to something really great and important and uh, important for Ukrainian culture from this image that uh, Soviet power tried to create. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, because I'm, you know, mindful of, of your time and and our participants' time. So I think I'm gonna pause here. I want to make an offer to all of you and anyone who is still on our call with us, as um, 
someone who works at a great democratic institution, a library. Um, I am here to help with your research going forward. Um, I think what we heard today has the bearings of a special journal issue. Uh, it, this has been a fantastic webinar and I think it'll be wonderful to share on uh, our YouTube channel. So I want to thank Mayhil Fowler, Oksana Semenik, Rostislav Semkiv, and Maria Sonovitsky for joining us. And um, thank you so much. And thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.